Good morning, everyone. Hi, hello. My name is EJ, and I am back again with another art for us to dissect and talk about. And, um, you know, <laughs> just watch because it's really actually cool to watch a time lapse of art being made and whatnot. But, um, so yeah, uh, this is my gig. <laughs> this is my jam. I do narrated our time lapse where I talk while one of my, uh, well, a time lapse video of my artwork, uh, plays. So I could talk about that particular artwork. So, um, but yeah, um, so for this particular, uh, video, I am doing, uh, an artwork for the daily spit paint group in Facebook. Um, this is really cool. This is really interesting. And I wanted to use this video as a platform to talk about certain things that really <laughs> requires a huge mention, um, particularly, uh, image rights and fair use act and all those really good stuff that artists really need to pay attention to, especially when they're doing, uh, their creative artwork and whatnot. So, but before I proceed into that, uh, I guess now would be a great time for me to talk about what is going on in the video at first. Um, so the very first step that I did was I made, um, kind of like this gradient background. I was just like messing around, playing around, but, um, oh, well, before I talk about that, I think it's very important to talk about what the prompt for that day was. Um, so daily spit paint group again real quick to uh, Real quick description of the group. Uh, we do 30 minutes pit paints or speed paints uh, That's all the minute. That's all the time that you get It's just 30 minutes to come up with an image composition um, Really nice daily art practice. It's a nice way to warm uh, warm up my artistic muscles. So One of the prompts for that day because we get four prompts um but one of the prompts for that day was prototype 60. And so, um, I have a very unique interpretation of that particular prompt. Uh, typically when you say prototype, uh, you think of some form of object or some form of machine or something that is being developed and constantly improved upon. And so you'll have like prototype 15, prototype 17 of a jet engine of some sort, for example. Um, the unique interpretation I did is that I decided to draw a humanoid character, um, which is kind of not a prototype. <laughs> I mean, if people are trying to do some form of biological experiment, like they're trying to breed like a specimen or something, they typically say the word specimen. So in this case, if, if whatever this thing that whatever this humanoid character that I have in this little chamber bed of sorts, um, that should, if that is, is biological in nature and not say robotic, for example, then yes, that humanoid creature, um, should be called a specimen. But if it's, wait, <laughs> I can not remember what I, uh, mentioned earlier. Let me rephrase. If that humanoid character that's laying down inside that chamber is biological in nature, then it should be called specimen. So it should be specimen 60. If it's robotic in nature, then yes, you can use the word prototype. So I was kind of like stretching the truth here because I kind of, you know, saw this image in my head that I wanted to portray and I thought it'd be kind of cool to do like some form of humanoid creature and then leave it up to everyone else to interpret why it's called prototype 60. So yeah, that's basically what my idea impetus was. Um, but, um, how things started out, obviously going back to the process video and whatnot. So what I did was I did this gradient background, um, purplish pinkish, um, which is really cool. And then instead of starting out with a sketch, I decided to just block out my shapes. Um, 
which I blocked out the doctor figure on the left first and then I blocked out the chamber I can't remember the order of events now because I was concentrating so much and talking um, either I did the chamber first or I did the laying down uh, figure first I'm not quite sure but it, I obviously did like a, a blocking session over onto the right and obviously I'm still blocking um, right now uh, putting in some shadows and whatnot and then eventually um, the unique thing about this and how I ended up with pink instead um, instead of actually picking pinks was uh, I grabbed oh I totally forgot that I did orange not orange but like a brownish hue which is where the light's supposed to be. I did a color dodge. I thought I used pink. Wow, that is really unique. Okay. That is very unique. So, instead of like laying down pink, I picked a brown color, put it in color dodge to get my lights. And then that's how I brightened up the scene. And then eventually I will um, merge these two layers because this uh, this work right here is in one layer. And then I'll end up smudging everything into more recognizable shapes. And then I'll basically build my details on top of that, which my detail process is delineating my edges. Um, Sharp, uh, or sharpen my edges, uh, accentuate the shadows. If my shadows need a little bit darkening, I, I made it a little darker. And then of course I add highlights. So that's pretty much what's gonna happen for the rest of the process video. But what I really wanted to talk about was image rights and whatnot. Um, so when I got the idea to do you know, a, a stretch of the original prompt, you know, instead of doing prototype 60, you know, in my head, I, I couldn't really come up with like what a prototype, what machine I would, you know, draw or whatnot, um, to stand in for the prototype. So I kept like picturing, uh, an image of a person and so I decided to do a Google search and this is the part that kind of threw me off because I could not remember for the life of me what the search term I use because after you know I mean it's been a year uh, yeah it's been a year this was done in 2020 last year um, so it's been a year since this particular illustration and you know, when I did my pre notes on this, I really wanted to figure, I really wanted to give credit to the person that inspired me because whatever my Google search term was, I came up with a few um, hyperbaric chamber photos, right? And one of them um, closely matches this photo or this image that I'm doing. Um, in that photo, there's a doctor leaning in, talking to a patient in the hyperbaric chamber. And I think it's a hyperbaric chamber. It could have been a decompression chamber. I I'm not sure what the differences are. I'm not sure if it's the same thing or if they're different. But it's definitely a chamber of some sort where a person was laying down, right? And so, you know, uh, I got a lot of, you know chamber images and obviously i composited like a few of them into this final illustration but um this particular one image that i have has the doctor leaning in and has the patient talking to the doctor it's those two specific poses that are very reflective of that image anyways i wanted to give credit to that to that photo right and for the life of me i i could not remember exactly what my search term was because I started looking up hyperbaric chamber, uh, sleeping chamber and uh, decompression chamber, but none I, I could find. Um, I could not find the original image. And for some odd reason, I thought it was on Wikipedia too, but I looked up under Wikipedia and yeah, I couldn't <laughs> find that original image because I really wanted to give credit to the author. 
to the original photographer because yeah i mean this is like something that we as artists need to do we need to give each other credit for whoever inspired us and whatnot so but the other thing that i also wanted to talk about was whether or not i was even allowed to use the photograph in the first place because typically when i do my google search you know i use things for inspiration um but i don't heavily um copy the image um again this is a great example of that um in the original image everything was you know you like your generic hospital setting and that was what the photograph was um it wasn't anything special or anything in my illustration everything is purple right um so there's all this purple hues and pink hues and whatnot it, it definitely was not in the original image um and the other thing that's different is is the lighting scenario the lighting scheme uh, in this particular in my particular illustration the lighting scheme is coming from within the chamber it's lighting up the whole scene versus in the original photograph it was just you know straight up generic hospital lighting <laughs> it was coming from the ceiling um and so what i was gonna so obviously there's differences between my final illustration and my, and the original image and what i wanted to point out is whether or not i fall into the fair use act um and i guess i needed to talk real quick um a background information about image rights and whatnot um a when it comes to artwork um especially is for my own artwork for example you know you obviously don't want any of your creative products whether it be photograph or images or paintings and whatnot to be used without your permission right i mean it just makes sense right i mean if somebody takes one of my paintings and then puts it um on say um uh, the cover of a packaging which this actually happened to one of my friends um so if somebody takes like one in, like an image that I created and put it on a packaging of of some sort of product to sell somewhere else, um, I should be paid for that because obviously the person is making money out of your artwork without even asking you or without even paying you royalties. You know, it's just fair, right? And this actually apparently happened to one of my friends. Um, friend actually i take it back it wasn't exactly my friend it was my friend's friend but according to her one of her friends uh artwork was used for packaging for um a graphic card and it was being manufactured somewhere in asia it's like some really cheap graphic card and this person who lives in america has no legal recourse like there's just no way for them to sue someone in whatever southeast asian country there was um so yeah it happens all the time people steal images all the time and then they try to make money all the time and it is really really horrible that that happens to us artists and so that's the reason why i really wanted to look up the image to you know a ascertain what the rights were see if i could purchase it for example i mean if it's available for purchase for royalty free rights and i would love to purchase it just to make sure that i'm in the clear even though my artwork in this particular case kind of really actually not kind of but really falls into the fair use act which i'll talk about in a sec um but yeah um the fair use act well i guess i could talk about the fair use act the fair use act when it comes to images is is very vague it's very it's very very it's vague <laughs> and it's really hard to um help oneself to understand what this law is but basically the fair use act pretty much stipulates that yes you can take inspiration from somewhere else and recreate it as your own in this case right um i took inspiration for the person being inside the chamber and for the doctor leaning in and talking to the person that was like the biggest inspiration i have from the original photograph um so 
I'm allowed to do that if I radically change, you know, a lot of things from the original image or from the original artwork that it becomes hardly recognizable. Um, in this particular case, since I changed all the lighting schemes, since I changed all the colors, like the original image does not have any pinks, any purples. They were all generic hospital setting. Um, and again, like I mentioned, the lighting was coming from the ceiling. Since I changed all that, I pretty much fall in the fair use act because it's pretty much radically a different image. Practically the only thing that's similar to the original image is um, the person leaning in talking to the patient inside, right? I mean, that's really the only thing that uh, stayed the same. Um, so yeah, in that case, I kind of fall into the Fair Use Act. Now, where the Fair Use Act gets really, really tricky is that, you know, if um, something in that particular thing that I kept is too recognizable, um, then it becomes problematic. Like it doesn't, I don't fall into fair use act. For example, if say, um, this is a movie still or something, right? And the person say, let's just talk, let's just say the doctor leaning into the patient. If the person, if the doctor was like a, a very recognizable actor, say um, Brad Pitt or something, and I painted the same, you know, character or I painted the character and didn't change Brad Pitt's look and, and the way I painted it, it looks pretty much exactly like Brad Pitt. Well, in that case, that kind of falls into like a very great area where that's too recognizable even though if i change a lot of the stuff but if if something in there is way too recognizable then it might not um land as a fair use act um using people's faces is very difficult um a great example of that is um a celebrity uh doing studies of celebrities a lot of artists do that a lot of um well, a lot of artists do that. I mean, it's a great way to face up. Uh, it's a great way to face. It's a great way to practice face painting or portrait painting, not face painting. Um, you look up celebrity pictures and you just paint the celebrities. Every artist on DeviantArt or Tumblr or Instagram or, you know, any other social media hub out there. I mean, we all do it. I've done it. I've done portraits of Rachel McAdams and... Barack Obama, for example, and um, a lot of artists sell these uh, portraits, which technically they're not supposed to. Like, I mean, legally they're not allowed to do it because they need to pay royalty fees to the original photographer who took those celebrity photos. And it's so rampant. It's so rampant in in the art world, where you know. Artists steal each other stuff. It's so sad, you know. Like I'm trying to, my best to give credit where it's due, and trying my best to make sure that I don't get any of my stuff stolen. But I mean, it happens, and oh man, yeah, I could go on about it. So, um, and that's the reason why I tried my, you know, hardest to try and look up this original image because I, you know, even though. I still land in the fair use act because really there's really not nothing recognizable from my final illustration to the original image. Um, it was still important to me, you know, because artists and people steal all our work all the time. And it's really, really depressing. So, yeah. But anyways, I guess enough about that subject. I mean, this is a very interesting subject and I mean, I could go on and on about it, you know, um, because there's just so much stuff to talk about it. And, and what's really more difficult about um, all of this, you know, image rights and art artist rights and whatnot, is just the fact that, like, the Fair Use Act is a very much an American thing. So when it comes to, like, dealing with situation that crosses America's border, that gets really, really more complicated, such as the case with my friend's friend. You know, I mean, 
if that company who stole his image and put it in a packaging, if that was an American company, I mean, that guy has absolute legal recourse, right? Um, but since it was like in a totally different country, then it just became like even more uber complicated. So, yeah. But anyways, um, that's really all I have to say about that. Um, I guess the key takeaway from this whole conversation is that if you're an artist watching this particular video of mine, please, as much as possible, as much as you can, um, do give credit to your art inspirations, especially photographers. Photographers get screwed up a lot uh, because it's so easy to look up their images with a Google search. So yeah, give credit to the photographer and if you can pay, pay them royalty fees. Um, that's why I try to avoid as much as I can all royalty images. Like when I do my Google search, there's an option to look for public domain images, which is what I always do. Or I always go to, to sites that offers free images, uh, royalty free. Um, pixels is, uh, pixels.com is a great example of that. They offer free images for you to use. Um, you don't even need to give credit to the original photographer or not, which I always do. Um, another, uh, great example of, uh, site is textures.com. I always get my textures from there. Um, uh, and then Photobash. Photobash offers some free images for you to use too. So those are like three of my top sites that I always go to. Pixels came out of nowhere. Like I wasn't even using Pixels until like a year or two ago. Um and they're really great um like some of the images in there is just so awesome and then of course you have your standard stock sites like uh, getty images and whatnot all of those you obviously have to pay uh in order to use your images and whatnot so and that's what i was trying to do i, I really was trying to search for my inspiration for this particular illustration um under stock photos and i couldn't find it because i really did want to purchase it so yeah but anyways, let's watch this particular video um, process and I could talk some more about art in this illustration and image rights in a little bit. Okay, so this particular illustration is almost done. Um, I thought that I had five more minutes to talk, but then I realized it's actually gonna end in within a minute, so yeah. But uh, before this video ends, really the biggest key takeaway, if you're an artist, is to always credit your inspiration if you can credit it, and if you can pay um, royalty rights to them please pay them royalty rights because us as artists need to get paid man <laughs> so yeah um but yeah i always uh it, it's always such a good thing uh a good feeling when people do that to you so yeah you know 
give you credit and pay you <laughs> so yeah but yes that's it that's the end of my illustration art process i hope you learned a thing or two from my conversation i will see you guys in the next video like and subscribe good night